turn on your microphone. Yes. Yeah. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming. Uh, I'm Alexander Vakru, the executive director of the Davis Center for Russian and Eurasian Studies. And the Davis Center is thrilled to be cooperating with HURI, the Harvard Ukrainian Research Institute, on this event um, to talk about what we've all been transfixed by for the past eight months. It's, it's hard to believe that it's been eight months of, of horror. Um, and I'm sure that we are all obsessively following the news, some more obsessively than others, but it's rare that we have the opportunity to sit down with some people who are willing to take us beyond the headlines and really explain some of the why behind the what. At least that's your task, gentlemen. Um, before I start, I wanted to give a couple of uh, rules. We are live streaming this event. Please be aware of that. So if you have questions, I'd ask that you raise your hand. I'll call on you. And please wait for the microphone so the people that are watching uh, at a distance can hear your question. Um, and a question, just a reminder, has a question mark at the end. It is not a comment. It is a question. And don't make me interrupt you, because nobody likes that. So if there's any other comments, no, let me introduce to my left, Serhi Plochi, the Mikhailo Khrushchevsky Professor of Ukrainian History and the director of the Harvard Ukrainian Research Institute. I was going to bring his books, but the pile is so big that I couldn't actually manage. Um, he's focused primarily on an international history of World War II and the Cold War. And his most recent book is Atoms and Ashes, A Global History of Nuclear Disaster. To my right, Professor Timothy Colton, the Morris and Anna Feldberg Professor of Government and Russian Studies, and also the chair of the Harvard Academy for International and Area Studies. He's also the author of a, a pile of books. Um, most recently, Everybody Loses the Ukraine Crisis and the Ruinous Contest for Post-Soviet Eurasia, a rather prescient book written a couple years ago with Sam Cherub. So I'm going to open by asking some questions while you formulate your brilliant questions. Um, and I'm going to start with a relatively simple one. First to Serhi, as a historian, what has surprised you most in this war? Mm. Uh, uh, as a historian, I'll start. Please, I'll start, yeah. um, start with Kiev and Rus, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I, I'll, I'll tell how I learned about the, the start of, the, of this all-out invasion. I, I was on sabbatical in Vienna and I woke up in the morning and I went to check my iPhone and somehow I went immediately to the to email and there was um, an email from Tim Colton with the uh, with the uh, basically the, the, the subject line my goodness <laughs> and and I realized that uh, Tim was right when we had before I left we had these discussions about whether the war was coming or not and and, and Tim was saying that it was and and uh, I was subscribe kind of supporting the idea that the war is probably coming but not now uh, partially the argument that I heard from the Ukrainian side and made a lot of sense for me was that. Uh, the, the timing was wrong for Putin when everyone was watching, so that he would be more interested in, in, in the situation when no one was watching. So from that point of view, the, 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 the timing came as a surprise, uh, and then the fact that Tim Colton was right was another <laughs> surprise. Uh, uh, but uh, but uh, the, 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 uh, another big and, and positive surprise was the fact that uh, uh, something that everyone agreed on, both in Moscow and in Washington, that Kyiv would not last for more than three to six days, that there would be a blitzkrieg that didn't materialize, that Ukraine, Ukraine, uh, um, Zelensky didn't flee, Kyiv didn't fall, Ukrainian army uh, fought back, and the, the Ukrainian, uh, the polling data from Ukraine, it seems to me, never showed less than 70 to 80 uh, percent belief that Ukraine would emerge victorious at the end, even at the worst moments in, in February and, and in March. So that, that, that belief in victory and, and that, that resilience were, were another, another big, big and positive surprise. Tim, you were right, apparently, about the start of the war, but I'm sure there are other things that have surprised you. Well, you know, I was right um, when we had that conversation uh, shortly before the event, because I was, but this 
point I was convinced it was going to happen. However, I didn't think it was going to happen six months before. It was only, I went to Russia last October, remember, and that's when I contacted yeah. you and I got back and said, you know, this is something scary is going on here. And then I started to think about it as a real possibility. Um, you know, political scientists of the rationalist persuasion kind of start with the fact that, uh, the observation that wars are rather rare events and that they only happen when certain basic processes break down. <clears throat> and so there's a famous article by James Fearon from the mid-1990s, which lays this out with game, th game theory and so forth. It's been cited like 500,000 times or something. <laughs> And I recommend it quite highly, uh, even if you don't, in the end, agree with his claims. It, it certainly makes you think. And so uh, he, uh, so the model he sets up is th there are two antagonists, uh, two adversaries, two states. And this, and this is already a simplification, of course, <laughs> only two. Um, and if if uh, each is perfectly informed about the other, then there actually shouldn't be a war because the weak should bow to the strong. Uh, why go to all that trouble of fighting a war if you already know that the other side is more powerful? So it would be very unusual to have a war between the United States and Chile, for example. Um, <clears throat> so this leads you in the direction then of wondering what could have gone wrong. And one of his central variables is information. Uh, so uh, as I've already indicated, uh, information uh, and uh, leaders who are misled by it in a, what turns out to be incorrect and inaccurate um, information. So in terms of war initiation, uh, I mean, I certainly felt that something was coming. But taking this particular form that, that is of an all-out assault along this incredibly wide front um, on the assumption that not much more than 120 or 30,000 actual troops, as opposed to trench diggers and uh, latrine cleaners and so forth, were somehow going to pull this off. Uh, so I thought until the very end that it was going to be something much more selective. And the U.S. intelligence knew that they were getting ready to try and seize Kiev. So that made a certain amount of sense. Okay, pull that off with your force. But then at the same time, to send, you know, to take Snake Island and send forces near Odessa and uh, advance into the Donbass and so forth, it, it, it seems like they were hopelessly overcommitted almost from day one. So that makes you think again about information. What went wrong here? Well, maybe Putin just heard, heard what he wanted to hear. He had his mind made up, and no one was going to tell him otherwise. But also, maybe quite possibly, I'd say quite likely, he was getting bad information from his people. And uh, that isn't necessarily because they were bad people, but because the system is bad. So they kind of, my thinking sort of strays, uh, to some extent, in, in that direction. Um, there's also the whole, you know, uh, and I'll close on this point. There's the whole question of what, what the Russians thought they were going to achieve with all of this anyway. Um, and you know, we know that they, there were negotiations with the Ukrainians, which we can talk about more fully in a minute, um, until, the, uh, well, into the month of May. And in those negotiations, the Ukrainians made all kinds of concessions. So in terms of the points, the, the demands that Putin uh, and Lavrov and the others voiced before Christmas, neutrality, you know, um, no foreign bases, uh, no uh, foreign, exerc uh, foreign exercises on Ukrainian territory, um, well, permanent neutrality on the sort of Belgian model, like all this stuff. The Ukrainians seem to have conceded most of those points. Now, they wanted to get something in return, of course, which was um, multilateral security uh, arrangement with 11 guarantors, one of which would be Russia. But the formula was essentially, if the Ukrainians made all of these concessions, then the others would guarantee that in the case of an attack on Ukraine, they would come to its defense. So it wasn't exactly an alliance, it was a security tripwire. Mm -hmm. And the Russians indicated uh, that uh, the ones who were in, uh, these talks were held in Turkey, um, and uh, they indicated that they thought this was all looking very positive, even Putin, initially said that I think this is kind of a breakthrough, but then something went wrong. Um, and so now, in terms of Russian behavior since then, again, I have a big question mark. What are they doing anyway? So they had largely achieved just through uh, initiating the war and threatening it and then doing it, um, what you know, Ukrainian um, agreement to many of the conditions that they had posed before. But they weren't willing to accept them in May. And then, of course, within weeks, 
the, all the stuff about referendums and territories. So somehow things moved on to that other level. And I think this makes things, um, this makes a, a resolution of the conflict even more difficult, like really, really difficult. And that's, we should be talking about that as we proceed. Mm -hmm. So that's a bit of a long-winded answer, I'm sorry. Okay, <clears throat> but you, you suggest that something happened in May to change the dynamic in the negotiations. May is almost history at this point. <laughs> Sorry, do you, do you have a sense of what changed in the Ukrainian approach to the war? Uh, well, uh, I, I uh, think that uh, really, from my perspective, nothing changed in, in April or May. Uh, the uh, um, demands for Ukrainian neutrality, the, the uh, demands on NATO to move forces away from, the, uh, from Eastern Europe uh, was a smokescreen. Uh, there was no real interest in negotiating these particular issues. Otherwise, there would be no ultimatums. Otherwise, there would be acceptance maybe of the Ukrainian position uh, or, or concessions earlier on. Uh, the the uh, issue there was, was in, in my opinion, of a different kind. It wasn't about NATO. NATO was created for the uh, Russian public, for, for the outside public. Uh, the matter, the war actually didn't, didn't start in February of 2022. 20, the war started in um, February of 2014, with the Russian takeover of the um, building and, and premises of the parliament, Crimean parliament and Crimean, uh, Crimean uh, seat of government. And the issue there was to, to force Ukraine um, to join the, the Eurasian Union. So the, the crisis started with the uh, Ukrainian Revolution of Dignity, insistence on the signing of association agreement with European Union. If Ukraine signs association agreement with European Union, that wasn't NATO, that wasn't even a uh, um, uh, status of, of a candidate member, but the point was that Ukraine would not be able to join the, the uh, Eurasian Union. And the, the point was to, to force Ukraine to do that. Uh, Yanukovych flees, Russia moves in to seize Crimea and then tries to impose a particular sort of a constitution where it would be able to block any Ukrainian movement toward the West through control of, of, uh, of uh, probably Eastern Ukraine. Uh, uh, so that, that was the idea. And then the, the, second, the second rendition of the um, Minsk agreements was exactly about that changing the constitution, blocking the, the Ukrainian movement toward the West, and uh, really uh, establishing the Russian control over the post-Soviet space, which would be incomplete without Ukraine, the second largest post-Soviet republic. <clears throat> so, and by, by the time, uh, again, big hopes were on, on Zelensky. Uh, and the negotiations that were taking place in Paris in 2019 send a very clear signal to Putin that Zelensky is not caving in. Uh, so one, one can read the, the historical essay of Putin, where he makes, makes claim that Zelensky is making these this promises and then nothing is happening. So the issue was not NATO, the issue was not neutrality of Ukraine, the issue was the control over Ukraine and then the control of the post-Soviet space. Uh, the, the, the model 2022 was the same model as 2014. One, once it backfires, the plan B is just grab as much of territory of Ukraine as possible. Crimea in 2014, uh, the southern Ukraine and eastern Ukraine now. And from that point of view, uh, the, the, the uh, deal on the neutrality of Ukraine really didn't... didn't uh, um, uh, um, again, I, I don't think that, that, that Russia was uh, prepared to take it. Uh, and uh, that, 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 that wasn't the goal in the war. So from that point of view, again, I, I think that uh, the, the, the whole NATO and neutrality thing is, is if not a smokescreen, then at least secondary issue. The, the primary issue, the primary goal is control over Ukraine and control 
through that of a creation of some sort of, of Eurasian, of the Eurasian um, space under, under control of Moscow. Um, uh, on the Ukrainian side, again, uh, you see that um, the, the battle uh, for, for Kiev, the Russians were defeated there and had to withdraw. So once Ukrainians started to see that they're actually uh, able to fight back the Russian aggression on the, on the battlefield, their, their readiness to go uh, and, and uh, mm, uh, make concessions suddenly reduced around the same time as the result of the victory uh, in, near, near um, Kiev, you get Bucha, which certainly is, is, is something that, become, uh, that, that makes more difficult uh, continuation of any sorts of negotiation, mobilizes the West. This is an example of the, of the war crimes, again, genocide or crimes against humanity or the war <coughs> crimes, again, that the lawyers are out there. So this is happening around the same time. But again, my, my overall take on that is that the uh, NATO and Ukrainian neutrality was never the primary goal of Russia. And the shift is happening around the, the, the um, for, fortunes of war change, change near, near Kiev. At least that's, that's, that's my take on that. Yeah, well, that's it was certainly interesting. Um, I think there was a lot of smokescreen in those pre-Christmas announcements, especially the stuff about uh, returning to the status quo as of the late 1990s and so forth. Uh, they, uh, like, maybe they weren't so well informed, but they certainly didn't think that anybody was going to take that seriously. As for what, how important NATO was, you know, I just over so many years having had so many conversations with Russians about it, I, I think it was important, but uh, it's uh, ultimately linked to these other matters, including P Putin's personal obsession with establishing that Ukraine is not a real country and all that stuff. And that, that's a sort of fixation of his, which, you know, when we get access to his diaries or something, maybe we'll see when he started to, 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 to obsess over this. I mean, the early Putin, who comes to power in 2000, uh, you know, didn't seem to think that was, wasn't high on his list of issues, that's for sure. Uh, but, but something happened to uh, move him in that direction and uh, that's the historians will figure that out eventually. I think for the moment we're, we're doing a lot of uh, a lot of speculating. I mean, it is the fact that they initially seem pretty receptive to these ideas. So the the um, in fact we now have reports that Kozak uh, Dmitri, I think it is, uh, who was um, a head negotiator in the in the weeks before when they had these contacts before the invasion, uh, had. Um, work something out with the Ukrainians kind of along these lines. And so maybe what, what they were doing was revisiting that. Uh, and Putin said no. Um, Putin said no uh, and probably uh, informed the Siloviki group uh, to this effect in that famous televised uh, audience, uh, which apparently had an after part where, where Kozak uh, openly disagreed with Putin and said, you're, you're making a big mistake. And he's not been heard from much since. <laughs> he's not been, I don't think he's been harmed or anything, I, mm -hmm. but I, uh, he, he's disappeared mm -hmm. uh, from, public, uh, from the public eye. Uh, so, so somehow the idea floats back. The, the um, head negotiator, I'm not sure it was uh, on the part of the Ukrainians, Podolyak or something like that, but for Russia it was this fellow Medinsky, who is a for, so it's kind of a light, pl political lightweight, former minister of culture, you know, patriotic, Russophilic uh, sort of person. Uh, with no diplomatic experience and, and no uh, standing with the, hard, you know, the real hard, tough hardliners. He's the one who brought this package back from Antalya to, uh, to uh, Moscow, and they thought about it. Um, now, in terms of you know, uh, where this would have taken them, so if the goal was to subordinate, uh, you know, to draw Ukraine back into the Russian orbit and that sort of thing, then I have difficulty seeing how launching a war to, uh, to uh, capture all of these territories was going to accomplish that, because it had the effect of totally alienating every, every, everybody else in Ukraine. So, I mean, the, the net effect of the war, eight months into it, is to make the, the uh, task of somehow ever bringing Ukraine back into their 
orbit essentially hopeless. Like, I don't think anybody could accomplish that now. Well, no? well, well uh, look, uh, what, 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 what we hear is that the idea is, and everyone believes that that's most likely scenario, that uh, Kiev would fall. Zelensky would either flee or be right. killed or arrested, uh, the, the sort of a Kabul yeah. uh, scenario, and uh, the, the intelligence services that surprisingly turned out to be right were also talking about a different, different candidates, from, from Yanukovych to, to Muraev to others, who would mm. replace, uh, so creating a puppet regime in Kyiv. So that, that would solve the the, 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 would solve the problem and the issue, and that probably was was part of the thinking uh, taken into account. One hundred fifty thousand troops. That, yeah. uh, as you said, absolutely, this is not. Uh, if there is a resistance, if there is a war, but that th that would be more than enough if you think about Ukraine in terms of twenty fourteen. Mm. And my understanding is that one of the big miscalculations uh, in terms of the intelligence reporting that was coming to Kremlin, and of course they were, they were given what, what Putin wanted to hear. Uh, he spent the entire, the entire um, COVID time writing the historical essay, right? <laughs> so we, we know very clearly what he thinks and what he wants, they, they read it too. Uh, and um, the, the um, idea was that it would be a repetition of, of Crimea, or maybe the worst case, Donbass. And that would be a military operation. So in that sense, given this name, probably he, he, he thought in those terms. So uh, it's, it's like uh, uh, Hitler attacking, attacking Poland. He was not going to start the Second World War. Uh, Putin uh, trying to take over Kyiv uh, didn't plan to start the war in which his army would be mm -hmm. would be would start defeat. And so I think uh, uh, we started our discussion with what surprised us. I'm sure that there was a lot of things that surprised Putin in the <laughs> in, 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 in the in the process of that war. But it, it also raises the question, Tim: How how could the Russians have gotten Ukraine so wrong? Um, you know, there is a lot of, of information that suggests that Ukraine changed significantly since 2014, and the Russians somehow missed that political shift. Is it because they started to see it as a domestic issue? Well, we ran into that many times in Moscow. Um, is it that yeah. they didn't have expertise on the ground? Well, how could they get it so wrong? Yeah, I wonder what Ukrainian studies in Russia really amounts to. I suspect very, very little, right? Uh, it's it's underst the understudied neighbor. Yeah, I don't really have much of a theory on that. Um, I mean, maybe Sir, Sir, he's right. It's reading, drawing lessons from the last war or something like that, um, and not not paying attention. Um, yeah, it's a it's, mystery. It, yeah, <laughs> it is a bit a bit weird. You know, they got 2014 right, actually, didn't they? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, it turns out that it was uh, um, like taking candy from a baby, but. But then they thought it'll be like that the next time. That's you know, uh, that's intuitively, intuitively, intuitively a rather attractive notion. But I don't know that we can prove it exactly. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, we do see action reaction. You know, in terms of um, in terms of them waiting for a new leader to come along. So they it, it sinks in that Poroshenko is not going to implement Min Minsk too. So they um, you know they're kind of non-committal when Zelensky's elected, and, but they're hopeful that he's going to be more you know, amenable. And he, after all, had talked about ending the war and all that stuff. And that's when it becomes clear, like you said, I don't remember precisely when that was, but that either he wasn't interested in doing this or that he wasn't able to impose his version on the others, which may also be half true, that, that, then, the, then the line gets very, very hard. Uh, and, and you start the Medvedev statement and the essays and all that stuff start to tumble out. Um, and um, so there is some connection with real world events there. Mm -hmm. But as for what's going on in their, head, uh, their heads, it's much harder for us uh, to get at that. I, I mean, I have to uh, grant that point. And Russians that, with whom I've had these conversations over many years are often not, I don't find them very sentimental about the Ukrainians as you know, the same one people and brothers and all that mm -hmm. stuff. They're kind of the country next door. 
uh, that we, we cannot allow to escape into the embrace of, the, of, the, of a hostile West, you know, something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, and maybe I'm getting that wrong. Would it be any different if uh, the, the big country next door was, let's say, a, a, a gigantic Estonia? <laughs> I don't know. Um, uh, so there, Putin couldn't make up a point about them being exactly the same people and so forth. Mm -hmm. But I, you know, some of the same difficulties might have arisen, I think, mm -hmm. yeah, as a counterfactual. Uh, now, you know, t uh, 2014 le leads to this uh, burst of symbolic politics, the statues and the, you know, uh, uh, Hersonez and, and all of that. Um, maybe there was an emotional reaction, something, uh, you, you know, you have to go psychological on this perhaps to, mm -hmm. to see what was going on in their heads. Crimea is for them, I think, uh, I mean, they really see Crimea as a Russian place, there's no doubt about that, a Russian imperial place. And, uh, you know, Putin goes there a lot. He goes there to visit the naval base, but he also goes there to visit the church. Uh, and he uh, celebrates Navy Day there. And he, um, you know, builds the monument to Alexander III in, in, in Crimea, right? <laughs> the, the sort of least reputable of the, of the last a few generations of the Romanovs. But even this person yeah. deserves yeah. to be venerated, and the place to do it is in Crimea. Oh, he uh, died there. Well, and they all had houses there, Yeah, right? but yeah. Alexander III died there. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I didn't know that, actually. Yeah, but, yeah. but they, you know, they said the royal family was all over Crimea and the, and the aristocracy, so. Oh, I mean, it, it seems like the Russians did at least two things wrong, right? They underestimated the Ukrainians, and they overestimated their own military. Yeah. Right? And I think everyone has been shocked to see the extent to which the supposedly second largest second most powerful army in the world turns out to be the second most powerful army in Ukraine. Um, <laughs> well, you know, so you can go back and find studies of this. The Rand Corporation's done a whole bunch of these reports. And uh, yes, there was a general tendency to overestimate for sure, but it was pretty clear by two or three years ago that some of the talk about military reform, especially on the hardware side, was out of, uh, out of sync with reality. Mm -hmm. So they developed this new generation of terrific tanks, the Armada tanks, but it turns out very few of them were delivered. They were so expensive that they ended up you know, using cheaper, older ones. Uh, and I, I do remember one. Uh, so somebody said at a certain point, you know, the Russian army is at the point now where it, it can seize uh, the, cap the Baltic capitals within 48 hours or something like that. And they, so these people did s some studies of, of logistics and pointed out that uh, that Russia's ability to, uh, to move stuff around was very limited. It was still a rail-centered army mm -hmm. at a time when everybody else had you know, moved uh, off rail. And you know, the point was that don't, don't be too sure that they can do this for too very long or over enormous distances. And that, that turned out to be a real problem, right? The fur mm -hmm. further away they, they get from Rostov, uh, the, the fewer uh, uh, you know, bullets and, and, and soup cans they seem to have. Um, and uh, so not, maybe none of these things is exactly the point, but I think they kind of add up to, yeah, mm -hmm. uh, overestimation. And Putin, uh, you know, entrusted the, uh, he's never had a military, professional military minister of defense. Mm -hmm. So Sergei Ivanov was like him from uh, uh, KGB Foreign Service. Uh, and then you have uh, the civilian, Serdyukov, right, who'd been in the furniture business. Right. Uh, and he's disgraced in a, in a corruption uh, scandal and replaced by Shoigu, who's worn a uniform for many years, but he's no soldier either. Mm -hmm. You know, he was head of this emergency uh, uh, ministry, whatever they call it, the old civil defense body. And, you know, um, maybe it would have made sense to have, uh, you know, somebody smarter running the Ministry of Defense. Mm -hmm. But Putin tends to stick with people. I, he won't stick with Shoigu, there's mm -hmm. no way. But, uh, you know, I mean, he's, he's had the same foreign minister for 18 years. Mm -hmm. Um, how many secretaries of state have we had since 2004? Probably seven or eight, right? Mm -hmm. He's had the same one, mm -hmm. uh, who says the same things over and over again. And she, even Shoigu uh, uh, is, has been there for 10 years. Uh, and uh, so maybe that's part of the problem also. So when he comes to power, he's surrounded by middle-aged you know, middle guys. Mm -hmm. But they're all, you know, they're very long of tooth. They've been there for so long. They're used to uh, the music in one another's voices and got lulled into this, um, I guess, uh, you know, just set of, uh, there's some fantasy involved, I, I suppose you'd have to say. Gerasimov, the chief of staff, uh, is definitely a, you know, a real professional soldier and seems to have a pretty good reputation even outside of Russia. 
but I don't think he'll be there for too long either, given what's happened. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, Zelensky comes to office and brings in a lot of people from his background, which are also not military guys. Um, how do you explain the fact that they've been able to really rise to the occasion, which they were not doing so well at before the war, but have managed to bring the country together and organize a military response has been very effective? Yep, and, and, and certainly another surprise. Uh, the, yeah, the, the, the Ukrainian Minister of Defense is uh, Mr. Reznikov, who is a lawyer, right? Mm -hmm. And as, as civilian looking as it gets, uh, Shoigu at least got the, 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 the image. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and uh, Zelensky's background, yes, we, we know that he, he's, he, he's an actor and. and uh, one thing about Zelensky that I, I uh, at least think what is there, that he has one uh, particular talent, probably more than one, but mm -hmm. that, that, that is there, which basically bridges two, two careers. And that's that he can actually feel the audience. And that was important for him as an actor, and then it became important for him as a as a president. And uh, his, his statements before the start of the war really reflected, were also reflecting the mood in the country. No one wanted the war, no one believed in that war, and he was there championing this, message, this message. That there would be no war. That there would be no yeah, war. Right. And then the war came, and uh, he just refused to leave the stage with all the <laughs> Jupiters, with all the being on him. And, and uh, I think that out of those 70 to 80 percent of people believing in the victory, I guess 10 to 15 percent would be Zelensky. He, he never left. He, he was a cheerleader for that. But 60, 70 percent were still were coming from the audience. Mm -hmm. And he was there as an amplifier. To, to, to mobilize. Mm. Then another, another uh, wonderful thing that he did, which Putin didn't do, he led the military to fight the war. Not Minister of Defense, not the head of the presidential <coughs> administration, not himself going and, and drawing the arrows on the map, uh, uh, but the military. And uh, another big surprise was that I was on a number of panels before, before the, the, the start of the war, and there were some very good experts, military experts. And uh, 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 those military experts were always talking about the Russian army. Whether they were right or wrong, maybe too optimistic or pessimistic, again, they, they were quite optimistic in terms of the, the ability to fight. Uh, but there was no one word about the Ukrainian army because no one kind of knew that it existed, <laughs> which, which was, again, a, a, big, a, a big positive surprise. So uh, uh, Zelensky turned out to be the person who is uh, um, rallying the um, resistance in Ukraine, support outside of Ukraine, and letting the military do their job. And I think that that formula, that formula became, became very, uh, uh, very successful. Um, so that's, that's, that's uh, at least would be my, uh, my take on that. But as, as, as Tim said, certainly the future historians, <laughs> <laughs> once, we have, once we have also the, the or maybe there will be intercepts of emails uh, uh, released by uh, either, either Christo Grozev or, or whoever else that, that uh, we historians would be able to write that history earlier than, than it would be otherwise. And keep in mind that U.S. Uh, intelligence got the Russian military wrong too. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, they, so to some extent they were um, believing what the Russians were saying. But you know, U.S. intelligence has a lot more data than that, and they clearly misread it. They were right about the attack, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, a lot of people didn't think it would happen because it just seemed uh, that it wouldn't bring about the desired result, and that occupying this uh, you know, large-ish European country 
uh, with uh, anything less than a colossal force was, uh, was, was just not going to work. But the, nonetheless, uh, you know, the CIA, um, we, don't, we haven't seen their, all of their reports, naturally, but uh, there have been many leaks, and it's, and it's clear from their public statements that they, they were very consistent in this prediction. But US, uh, uh, well, the US uh, intelligence establishment is, is enormous and multi-headed, and people like Tom Simon know all about it. Um, but uh, they were you know, certainly of the view that the Russians would, uh, would, uh, would uh, prevail rather quickly. And in fact, I even, at one or two of these meetings that I was at, heard it said that the, maybe the Ukrainians wouldn't even fight at all that they would, they, they would be in such fear of this you know, monstrous uh, military. So they were right on one point and, and wrong on the other. So that's also interesting. How, how is it possible mm -hmm. that, uh, you know, that they made this uh, particular mistake? As far as Zelensky is concerned, I certainly defer to uh, Sari here. But I like the point about the audience. I think that's, uh, I hadn't heard that before. That's very smart. And, and from this point of view, Putin is kind of the anti-Zelensky, right? In fact, you see him with COVID. Um, uh, you know, isolating himself, insulating himself from human contact to such an extent, these crazy long tables, I mean, you, you see the pictures, right? <laughs> Putin here and Macron like 35 feet away. Uh, and, uh, but there's something maybe sort of symbolic to that. Mm -hmm. uh, so I went last October to what was probably the last ever meeting, the Valdai Discussion Club, and Putin showed up in Sochi. And he was so far away from us, there were maybe 40 or 50 of us sitting there. And he, well, it was like from here to the middle of the, a lobby there, something like that. He was, he was small. He had the binoculars, uh, and that well, apparently that was COVID related. Mm -hmm. But nonetheless, it was taken to such an extreme, and he seemed quite content to be that far away from actual uh, people. And remember, you know, how does he relate to the population? Well, you know, he doesn't plunge into crowds. Uh, he his mo his best known uh, way of uh, of, of uh, relating to the population, to the narod, to the people, is the famous you know, hotline telephone thing, which is remote after all, mm -hmm. right? Uh, filtered questions coming from Siberia and uh, Belgorod and so forth that he then uh, uh, responds to often in a rather uh, clever way. You know, I mean, he's, he's, he has some wit in dealing with these things, but it's so remote. Um, Zelensky, it's, it, again, the thing about the audience, I, I like that, but the context is very important here, isn't it? So in the, in the familiar context of post-Soviet Ukrainian politics, Zelensky, uh, in the t several years after his election, was looking like a loser. Uh, his ratings were, had, had dropped. 60% of Ukrainians didn't want even to run for president again. He wasn't getting anything done. He was using, um, he was using uh, the levers of the state to uh, attack people like Poroshenko, who was charged with high treason, right? And he's still under accusation. Poroshenko is, the, is the, pre the president who started the process of rebuilding the army. And he said more than once, why does, anybody, why does nobody ever thank me for this? <laughs> but somebody should, actually. Um, and, uh, and also, let's not forget, uh, but then things change. And Zelensky, after making another mistake, which is saying, no, no, there won't be a war, then when, things, when the context changes, he's able to jump on it. So there's an, a real ability there. Uh, obviously, he's not air uh, proof, but still, there's there's some capacity for reading the crowd or reading the situation in a really interesting way. The other, the only other factor I would throw in, which hasn't come up yet, is you know the role of the West and the role of the United States. So he was, you know, they had been open to American training, uh, American uh, largesse of various kinds, but you know he's kind of been. He's not really the commander in chief. I think what Sergei, he says is true. He lets the generals do most of that. Uh, but he is fundraiser in chief, that's for sure. I mean, so we're now up to $90 billion in commitments. The, the Ukrainian defense budget in 2021, the last year before the war, was $5.9 billion American dollars. So without the, without, I mean, without the, um, the NATO and uh, uh, U.S. Uh, assistance, I, I, I do think even the Russian army would have defeated the Ukrainian army by now. But that assistance was provided, and he was—you know—he's been very good at uh, at getting it. I mean, to put it mildly, mm -hmm. I mean, this is a lot of cash, mm -hmm. uh, and they're depleting U.S. stocks of some of these weapons by now. We're just kind of shoveling it over there. <laughs> but without that, I think uh, that uh, you know it would it would have been almost hopeless. So, so he's, he's an amazing communicator. 
right? He's, he's done what had to be done so far in, in the war, mm -hmm. but is he going to be the person who can tackle some of the deep uh, institutional issues that have been bedeviling Ukraine since the collapse of the Soviet Union, the corruption, the kind of troubled democratic institutions? Sure, sure. Um, well, he is, um, um, again, uh, Tim is absolutely right that his popularity went down. <clears throat> but he managed to stay popular with the Ukrainian electorate more than any of his predecessor. Because again, the, the Ukrainian politics says, okay, you're elected. That's setting the bar pretty low, though. And, <laughs> and, and, then, and, and, and then going going down, and he basically uh, stayed stayed popular, semi-popular for longer than any anybody else. Mm -hmm. we, uh, um, and uh, uh, that that being uh, against the background when he came and started. Uh, all sorts of reforms uh, or attempts at reform brought the the uh, young Turks into the government led by Honcharuk and others, and then eventually caved in and dis dismissed the entire government and put in the people with whom he was more comfortable. So the the, the land reform was a big reform that was was passed under him, but others uh, others were not. Uh, but he uh, made made a point uh, uh, of fighting of fighting uh, corruption as a general kind of a slogan, but more specifically going after the oligarchs. Mm -hmm. And uh, the uh, story of him going after Poroshenko has also this right. element. Yeah. Then he was uh, before the start of the war in. War with the richest Ukrainian uh, oligarch Akhmetov, which sounded absolutely uh, in, the, in the conditions of the throwing of the growing Russian threat was completely insane. He also went after Medvedchuk and 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 Russian money and so on and so forth. And now the war uh, turned uh, actually created a situation in which his war on the oligarchs became, became uh, acquired the chances, he, he got the chances of winning it more than, more than it was, could be assumed earlier. Um, the the uh, um, uh, Akhmetov's, Akhmetov's wealth is maybe half of what it used, again, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. We, we all know about as of Stahl, among other things, or, or other enterprises, major enterprises in Mariupol, the owner was, uh, was Akhmetov. So Akhmetov's presence in the, in the media is uh, by now is non-existent. He, 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 uh, he closed down that whole thing. So um, whatever that means for the, for the war on corruption, uh, one thing that for me it's quite clear that the president, the president as, as an office would emerge actually much stronger out of this war than it was before. And that the oligarchs would be much, much weaker than they were before that. And uh, that, that, that uh, uh, creates an opportunity. That's create an opportunity for, uh, in the process of rebuilding Ukraine, also changing, changing the rules of the game and some forms of monopolization. Whether that will happen or not, but these chances of happening now, including because of that, that Zelensky's policy that looked completely suicidal before, before the start of the war, now start looking as a basically smart politics and, and, and something that can produce, produce positive results. Again, whether they, they produce or not, this is, this is a big question, but certainly the, the chances of that happening are, uh, I don't know, three, four hundred times higher today than they were 12 months ago. Okay. Yeah, um, the, this anti-oligarch campaign that he launched in 20, I guess 2021, right? Uh, uh, gets, it gets mixed reviews, put it that way. Um, so Keyes, the key of International Institute of Sociology, has asked questions about this, and, uh, about popular reactions to it um, in their polls before the invasion, of course. And um, a lot of people were suspicious that it was just another fight behind the scenes 
and that you know, uh, you know that uh, really uh, Zelensky wanted to get his hands on their wealth, you know, kind of thing. So a very skeptical, even cynical approach to it all. Um, Freedom House, uh, in its Nations in Transit report, has once or twice singled the campaign out for some criticism uh, because it, it gives enormous power to, to uh, officials to decide who is an oligarch, uh, to blacklist them, and to keep them out of politics and party life and so forth. I mean, it looks a little heavy-handed to me, frankly, <laughs> and, uh, and there's no, uh, apparently no judicial oversight. Now, it didn't really go that far because the, the, you know, the war got started in February 2022, but it was, there certainly were critics, including Americans, uh, saying this was maybe not the way to do it, even though the goal, of course, was one that should be um, taken seriously. The other thing about the oligarchs, though, I, I, I forget who, who was saying this not so long ago, something I read, was that <clears throat> the, um, the negative consequences of such a concentration of wealth for uh, democratic or even half-democratic politics are, are maybe fairly well understood, but don't forget that in, so, in some circumstances that having um, economic actors, business actors who are independent of the state can help um, uh, uh, in, cri in crisis conditions, help those who are looking in a more democratic direction. So they'll cite the Orange Revolution, for example. Um, and in, uh, in Georgia, certainly the Rose Revolution, where you had the defection of uh, business uh, leaders who had media holdings. Now, in, Ru in Russia, they don't really have those holdings. They did in the 90s. I mean, Kuczynski controlled NTV and Berezovsky controlled Channel One and all of that stuff. They weren't good guys necessarily, but there was a degree of independence and, and sort of a, a multiplicity of, of voices. So when, when uh, assuming the guns fall silent at some point, some kind of normal politics is reborn, somebody has to figure out how the business you know, stratum is involved in these things, uh, and yeah, you can it, do without Akhmerov and Kolomoisky perhaps as individuals, but there's, you know, in, in, in a market economy, there's a lot of accumulation of wealth and it has to be managed somehow. The other thing the polls say, by the way, about, about um, uh, how uh, political figures uh, and political institutions are being evaluated uh, is quite interesting. And again, this is pretty easy to, to uh, look up uh, in either Ukrainian or English. Um, KISS does this, but also NDI and IRA, IRA the two national party institutes, um, do, uh, they fund surveys that are quite readily available, easy to get at on, online. And so wh who is the most trusted by this point, um, individual or institution in uh, Ukraine? <clears throat> it's actually the army. Um, and it's now 90 plus, 95% or something, and people have uh, Dovieria in Russian. What is that in Ukrainian? Same name? Same word? Yeah. Uh, and now Zelensky is a fairly close second, of course. He, he gets very high ratings as well. But most of the other organizations that get these really high ratings are um, uh, the organs of state that deal with control. Uh, so it's, it's the emergency services ministry, the National Guard uh, and all the, uh, the Ministry of the Interior and so forth. They're all way up over 50%. The RADA gets um, maybe 40% or something like that. Political parties are, aren't even mentioned. They don't even bother to ask the question about them. <laughs> um, but then the question also, so it's, uh, uh, do you trust? And then there's a sub-question, how, how many people do you fully trust? And here the RADA goes down to like 5%. Now, I'm not sure the RADA deserves <laughs> that lower rating, but it is a little bit unsettling that under wartime conditions, the legislative branch uh, is, has been lowered to such an extent in the eyes of the people, and the executive branch exalted to such an extent. And political parties, um, you know, have, I mean, Ukraine doesn't really have a political parties. You know, it's got these sort of ad hoc coalitions that come together for elections, and they do very little else. And... Uh, so when you look to the future in terms of things that should be built, Ukraine, in a sense, had more of a, uh, a party system before 2014 than it does now, or even in the 1990s when the communists were still active and all of that. So that has to be built. And I'm not sure Zelensky is going to do that, but there has to be a sort of environment in which you can start, almost start over, almost from scratch, to build modern uh, competitive organizations. And, yeah, uh, it's, it's interesting that, uh, again, the, the start of the war in 2014 really killed ideologically uh, based parties. Mm. So the communists, of course, for, for obvious reasons. But the question is what happened to the nationalists? 
Right? Yeah. The, the, before that, there was Svoboda Nationalist Party, there were communists, and then there was the, the again, this uh, ad hoc coalitions. And the war killed both. And mm. the question is, why, why Ukraine, again, it was accused of being Nazi and nationalist and so on and so <laughs> forth, the, the country that doesn't have nationalists represented in the parliament because they never crossed the 5% uh, percent threshold, which is again raises raises an inter interesting question. Uh, the the mm, trust in the in the president was always much stronger than in the in the parliament in, in yeah, the, yeah. Uh, traditionally. Uh, but uh, the the champion uh, <coughs> before that there was the church in terms of the trust. Oh, so yeah. what, we see, what we see now different is that in Ukraine, there is a support for and trust in the state institutions. Again, the armed forces were there, and the armed forces were there even in December and in January, before, before the start of the war. They, they were higher than, than the president. They, 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 they were higher than the president. And uh, that, for me, again, looking historically even from 1991, suggests some very important development that is happening as the result of this war. Started the process in 2014, continues today, and this is the close and close association of Ukrainian electorate with the state and state institutions. Yeah. Yeah. Because they're there, in particular the army, to protect them, the services are there to help them, and this is a dramatic historical change because the Ukrainian project was formed and survived in opposition to the state. Mm. State is always foreign. It's, it's, it's an exploiter. It's, it's, uh, yeah. uh, the, 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 the state is something that Yanukovych can take and, 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 uh, and, 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 and take, take resources from you. And now there is, now there is this dramatic change. Another change that happened in 2014 was with the um, political map of Ukraine. Uh, again, before 2014, the existence of these ideological parties were there, but there was also a divide uh, uh, even more dramatic than in the United States be between blue and red <laughs> states and, and, and provinces, roughly half of Ukraine, and then the elections would be okay. The, the East would get more vote and the, the presidency would go this way, the, this, the West would get more vote, vote and it would go the other way. The election of Poroshenko, you look at the map, it's basically, it's, it's, it's landslide. It's 90% it's, uh, of the precincts would, be, would, would, would go into his column. <clears throat> and the same with Zelensky, despite the fact that, again, the, the, the population changed. Attitudes and things like that. 72% of the popular vote. But, but again, the, the, this is, uh, uh, Poroshenko lost a little bit in the East, Zelensky lost a little bit in the, in the West, but generally it's, um, the, the map is, is unified. So you get disappearance of the, of the ideological parties, which basically means that you, you, your other parties are not really fully, fully formed in the way how they're supposed. But you also got a much more unified Ukraine and electorate, which probably is reflection, reflection of the attitudes of the population. And that's, that's in, re in response to this threat posed by the war. Again, the, the process didn't, it's, 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 it's the story that begins certainly in 2014. Yeah, I, I, I think that's right. It does make you wonder a bit, though, about other cases that we can think of historically. So, for example, Britain um, doesn't have a national election between 1935 and 1945. And, you know, the British people seem to be very united during the war and all the rest of it. But, you know, as soon as they get a chance to vote, and uh, whenever that was, July 1945, out goes Churchill. Uh, so, so maybe there's a certain kind of unity that's for one purpose, fighting a war, fighting an, an, an aggressor, an invader, uh, an intruder. And, but then when you get normal politics, people start to think of their interests in different terms. Right? Maybe. I, 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 I think that the chances of that happening in Ukraine are very high. You, 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 you can go beyond, beyond Britain as well. Look at Poland and Pilsudski. See, the, this the, is why the, we need the historians. Yeah. <laughs> the, big, the, the, the big heroes come, uh, uh, come later. Uh, Eisenhower 
becomes uh, a popular figure not in 1945 when he is supposed yeah, to be yeah, one, yeah, but, right. but in the 1950s. And I think that there is basically a general idea, or at least the explanation that is provided for UK, is that the populace is really tired of the hardship of the war. Uh, they want to change the scene. Even the person who led them to the victory, they, 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 they want to forget that. And, and then the, 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 the big war heroes come Come, come in the next mm. cycle. So uh, again, it's 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 quite possible that that that's that that that, that what will happen in Ukraine as as well. And uh, I, I think this this is. This so Zelensky is, said in early April that uh, he could imagine, looking to the future after the war, um, that uh, it, uh, Ukraine would be like a big Israel. So a democracy, but you know, uh, encircled by enemies and uh, needing to defend itself. He he, uh, he made this comment. Um, uh, I forget. It was some an interview of some kind. That's interesting, um, but uh, it also makes you wonder to go back to the military. So um, one feature of Israeli politics, of course, is that military former military uh, men are very prominent in it. They don't monopolize anything, but you know, g uh, generals are are everywhere in the Israeli political class. And so it's you know, useful, interesting to wonder if that might happen in Ukraine. In Russia, since they're losing at this point, I, I'm not sure that the generals who brought them this war are going to be in very much demand. But in Ukraine, it, it might be different. And, you, and Putin's, the, the way he manages information is there's very little attention paid to uh, any individual soldier. Uh, so there's a spokesman for the Ministry of Defense Konyenkov or some, something like that, but he just seems to be a voice. And uh, as for the guys who are fighting the war, um, you can learn about this on a telegram channel, but you're not going to get it from the state media. They're just kind of soldiers fighting, fighting away anonymously. No, and, and, and from what we hear, actually, Zelensky is very, very aware of that possibility. Uh -huh. So the, the um, uh, um, Zaluzhny became, became a public figure, so he's not making uh, recently started to uh, make comments uh, again, but before that he was just didn't exist in in, in the media. Oh. And we certainly can look can look at the uh, uh, concern about the generals among well in in the 1945 Soviet Union. What is happening to Zhukov? What yeah. is happening to? We sent to Odessa, of course. Uh, right, right, <laughs> right. So, so, but again, if if you if our early analysis that the, the electorate is basically tired of the of, of the war leaders and want, want something else, so maybe maybe the the the, 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 the politicians overreact. Yeah. Well, we could keep this conversation going, but I have a feeling that there are a lot of questions, and I believe Tom had one, but you have to wait for the microphone. Okay. <laughs> And you have to start by introducing yourself, although you need no introduction, nonetheless. So maybe just, <laughs> I need no introduction. <laughs> <laughs> Microphone's on, on its way there. Yeah. <laughs> Don't stumble. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, uh, I'm Tom Simons. I'm a retired American diplomat uh, and a associate at the Davis Center. Um, I have a footnote to what Tim was saying about military assistance, because I think the hyphen between 2014 and 2020 is not so much in the equipment or in the financing, but in teaching Ukrainians to fight a different kind of war. Mm. You know, with small units, very mobile, flexible, able to switch, and, and the successes that they've had. And the Russians aren't able to deal with that kind of war. And that may also account for the popularity of the trust in the, the armed forces. But I have a question for each of you, if I may. <clears throat> yeah, for Tim, you know, reading through my commentary on what's going on on email, I'm getting a lot of things that says that Putin he can't afford to lose, either personally, or now we're starting to get the argument he can't afford to lose politically, either. I mean, Tim Snyder just had a long thing about that. And that uh, since he can't afford to lose, he's going to blow us all up. I mean, he's just incapable of negotiating. 
And I wonder if you think that's true. Okay. And for Serhi, my question is that if President Zelensky and Ukrainian political system defines victory as recovery of all the pre-1914, 2014, 2014. Mm -hmm. territory, and wants us to support that with whatever it takes, as President Biden has said we would, aren't we heading for a train wreck politically? Because when the United States no longer gives the Ukraine the wherewithal to recover all that territory, including Crimea, what's going to happen? Aren't, isn't it a recipe for disaffection disillusionment, anger, and breakdown of the situation that we have now? So I think these questions are linked, actually, um, because um, <clears throat> you know, it's not clear what victory would, would be uh, in this uh, very difficult situation. I'm just finishing today. I have to do it before I go to sleep tonight, a 4,000 word paper, very short, with Sam uh, uh, Cherub, my co-author, on uh, war termination scenarios for this war. And, um, and so we, we're using ideal types, essentially. Uh, and one of them is total victory. And um, it's hard to know what that would be for the Russians. Uh, so total victory involves not only defeating your uh, adversary, but making it impossible for him to um, uh, threaten you again. And so that means it could mean uh, uh, some combination of regime change, uh, territorial change, uh, uh, post-war uh, disarmament, all sorts of things like that. Um, and um, in the case of the Russians, uh, maybe they thought, when, well, they, I guess they did think when they made the move on Kiev that they were going to impose a puppet government and they were going to achieve total victory through that means. But now that seems quite out of the question. And so... Um, there are some issues there about what total victory would mean. Putin has somewhat of a luxury of declaring victory at a certain point and saying, okay, now we've won, but the Ukrainians aren't going to buy it, of course. They're going to, they're going to want to keep fighting. On the Ukrainian side, what I, I am concerned about the fact that it's not just a matter of what, can they get those territories back, because with every successive week, they seem to do better and better in the battlefield. So I guess we, can't, we can no longer say they can't possibly you know, get what's left of Mariupol back. Crimea is going to be tougher, and I, I, I don't think that's possible. But see, the thing is that even if they do that, that's not total victory. Because and, until they have made it impossible for the Russians to do it the next time, they're not going to be secure. Uh, and, you know, given the physical location of these two, you know, cheek by jowl, uh, Russia can make life miserable for Ukraine for the indefinite future uh, and, and give it a shot the next time with a much larger army. Uh, and so I think, uh, uh, no, the, the Istanbul Protocol that I mentioned before, March 29th, purposely sidestepped the issue of Crimea and, and in fact, the Donbass. And it said, these provisions that we, we've tentatively agreed to don't bear on those things, Let, so we'll set them aside. But now, of course, Zelensky's put all of that behind him, and he said, you know, it's part of our war aims now is to get Crimea back. Not very likely, it seems to me, because the Russians will go to almost any lengths to keep it. But let's say they did manage to do that. That's still not total victory. That's, it's, it's, you know, it's a, a big improvement over, over where things were, but uh, they, that will not mark the total defeat of, of Russia. So would Putin, what lengths would he go to? Well, we see, you know, the mobilization is not so partial. <laughs> we know uh, it's very clear that the, this 300,000 figure is uh, you know, quite mythical, and it looks like they're going to impress a lot more men than that. They're going to build a large army. They have to um, uh, you know, stave off defeat in the coming months, but there are going to be a lot of Russians out there in uniforms by, uh, you know, by spring. Um, and that's the answer for the moment. And so uh, you know, I think that's pretty clear. Uh, Tatyana Stanovaya, if you don't know her work, you should. She's really a brilliant... Russian uh, political analyst uh, who now lives in Paris. She has a, a political newsletter called R.Politica, which is available through Hollis, those of you who have access to the Harvard Library System. Uh, otherwise, you have to pay for it. Uh, but she also writes things for the open media. 
And she had something in, uh, maybe you saw it today, was it in the Moscow Times or someplace? Uh, foreign Affairs, I think. Mm -hmm. And she's convinced, and she's insightful, and she has very good connections uh, that, um, uh, we haven't talked about the nuclear weapons, but you know you can't ignore it. She's convinced that he, he is prepared to do it. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, even though that might be as big a blunder as February 24th, that uh, you know they're kind of getting ready to give this a shot if ev everything else fails. Uh, <clears throat> so I just throw that out as a, a, a possibility. Uh, w would that mean the start of World War III? Well, a lot of that would depend on us, but pro probably not. Uh, but, uh, but maybe. So um, a Russian, whom the two of us know very well, especially me, uh, commented not so long ago that, um, just last week, I think, that <clears throat> Russia, if, it, if pushed to do so, to, to salvage the situation, would, would use nuclear, uh, several nuclear weapons, perhaps. It wouldn't necessarily limit itself to tactical nuclear weapons. It might use a strategic weapon, probably just once. Um, and, and he said, would um, the United States retaliate? And he said the chance it would do so is slight, 1%, he said. But 1% is 1%. Uh, and he, he, it, it sounds like he thinks it's worth taking the chance. So even to see these conversations taking place is unsettling, uh, you know, for the first time really since uh, 1945, right? Uh, and uh, so I think we should watch it very, very closely and govern ourselves accordingly, because it's, you know, it could be a pretty hairy year ahead of us, I think. But can, my question was, can Putin ever settle for less than total victory? I think so. I yeah, because I don't think total victory is achievable. I think that they, what, what, you know, if you want my prediction, I think they'll both settle for um, a protracted war. I think that's what we're going to have. Uh, maybe an armistice if that can be achieved, but I think it'll be, uh, it could be a very long, uh, drawn-out thing, and it's better than the alternative for the Russians, and it may be better than the actual alternative for the Ukrainians. That's, I know it's a gloomy thing to say, and of course I can't prove it, but just that's where my thoughts lead me. So that's one of these other scenarios. I mean, the, the others, I mean, in addition to total victory, would be a negotiated settlement, but that seems virtually impossible at this point because they both said they won't talk to the other one on principle. It could, it could look very different you know, three or four years from now. But, um, and then the alternatives would be either an armistice or a protracted low-level conflict. So it wouldn't be what we're seeing now. It would be uh, you know, something involving uh, you know, some kind of line of control. Uh, and, and it could go on for a very long time. And uh, if it turns out to be an armistice, then you have something like Cyprus or, you know, or Kashmir would be a sort of bad form of that. Korea. Uh, Korea. Well, Korea is cool because there you have the 38th parallel, right? A very clear line. Where are you going to draw the line in Ukraine? So it's, uh, I don't think the Ukrainians are capable of uh, getting total victory over Russia. It's too much for them. Uh, and uh, the Russians have pretty well demonstrated they can't do that either. So we're going to end up in some messy middle situation, which might be prolonged. So I'm not an expert on the study of wars. But I re I've read a lot of stuff, but I'm not an expert. But one thing, a comment that's often made is observation is that once a war has lasted much more than a year, let's say, and we're, we're moving towards that pretty quickly, then the chances are much better than it would otherwise be that it's going to be quite a long war. The, these are the wars that then get very long. So Iran Iraq was eight years, you know, and uh, so I, I suppose you could say this is not impossible. Both countries end, ended up in ruins. Uh, really, uh, but you know, their leaders led them through this, and uh, and they ended up with uh, with basically an armistice. There's no, they didn't sign a treaty, but they don't fight anymore. Uh, and weariness at some point plays a role, and of course, erosion of the standard of living in Russia, maybe uh, at least as much as in Ukraine, uh, will eventually take its toll. You know, both of these countries have elections. Russia's, of course, are not very competitive anymore, to put it mildly. Uh, Ukraine is supposed to have two elections in 2024, which is not that far off. I forget the exact sequence, but I, I think it's, yeah, uh, president would be first, which I think in March, right, 2024. That's not much more than a year away. And then Rada in the fall. And Putin is up for re-election um, in, um, I guess, April or May. Now, yeah. of course, if he runs, he's, I assume, we can safely assume he's going to win, but it may not be so easy this time. 
Uh, and so they, they have to pay some attention to that as well. Uh, uh, the end of the war. Uh, the title of our event is uh, what, eight months? Eight months. Yeah. Well, it's eight years if, if you start the war in March of 20, 2014. So it's already a long war, you could say. So the war is go, you can split it into two and talk about the first Russo Ukrainian war, 2014, 2015, and then the second starts in 2022. <coughs> so and that, that's, that's the. the the reality out there, the, the uh, uh, conflict never became fully frozen in Donbass. The shelling was going on, some low level activity went on. And again, that is one of the scenarios that, that can continue after the, the active, uh, active stage of the, of the warfare is over. Uh, and uh, so that's, that's, that's one scenario, just continuing, continuing what, what happened before that. Uh, in terms of the, of the uh, negotiations and victory and things like that, these things can change. Uh, Putin started with saying that this is actually a Nazi, Nazi regime with whom he would not negotiate and, and uh, <coughs> Zelensky was there for the first week or two weeks actually demanding a personal meeting with Putin to solve this issue. Right. Uh, now, uh, Valentina Matvienko, wherever they are saying, okay, let, let's talk parliament to the parliament and so on and so forth. So the, 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 like it was in March of, of this year, whatever will happen on the battlefield will very much decide who is talking to whom, who is no, not talking, who is Nazi, who is nationalist, who is drug addict and who is not, because all of that was just going back and forth. Um, or alcoholic like with, with, with Medvedev. Um, now, that, that defines also to the definition of the, of the victory. The, 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 the two yeah. leaders are still very much in, um, capable of, of formulating and reformulating what, what that means. Uh, Putin is, is basically uh, putting himself in a position where, uh, where mm, there is less and less flexibility by the annexation of the territories that were not even controlled by him. And putting that into the constitution and, and through all these processes, there is, there is a loophole where it is said that the oblasts are included according to the uh, map on the, mo on the moment of their creation and the moment of their integration into the Russian Federation. That means that we can go <laughs> w w w w whatever we want, whatever we choose. Uh, mm, in terms of uh, Ukrainian, Ukraine reclaiming its territory, mm, one thing that this uh, war so far, this 80, eight, eight <coughs> months had shown is that uh, anything is possible. The, anything is possible, in, including with the Crimea. If, if we get a political crisis in Russia, uh, with Chechnya already ready to go for the, for, for, for the last 15 years, this is a basically a state within a state, with uh, Yakutia saying that we are not doing any more uh, any more mobilization with the uh, Dagestan protesting and mobilization is over. Uh, the, the, the Moscow potentially soon can have uh, issues much more important than Crimea and much more closer to home than that. And that, that would change the situation. So I wouldn't say that this, these things are completely how likely they are, this is another question, but whether this is possible, yes, there are scenarios under which, under which this is possible. What you see on, on the part of, of uh, uh, rhetorically, certainly, of, of Zelensky is with the start of the war raising the stakes, right? Uh, uh, in a sense, okay, we want to go not just back to the, to the demarcation line of uh, 20, 2015, but we want our entire territory back. <coughs> Neither Zelensky nor other, other leader in Ukraine uh, would be in the foreseeable future be able uh, to survive signing an agreement 
uh, where uh, he sits either in the either Crimea or Donbass or anything of that kind. So, but that we have a situation with the Russia and and Japan and the the Kuril Islands where this can go for. Yeah. Forever and ever. So it's there can be still claims and, and unresolved territorial uh, conflict and claims. The whole world is full of them. It doesn't mean that the world the, the world is at war. So I, I think that uh, the, 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 they still on the both sides have have the, the ability to define and redefine what what, what the victory is, uh, what, what what the victory is not. Uh, and uh, just um, thinking about about the nuclear option, uh, we are in a situation where uh, the um, nuclear blackmail is taking place. Uh, the closest probably a parallel would be the, the Cuban Missile Crisis, who is the famous phrase, the, 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 it looks like the other guy just, just like, blinked. Yeah, yeah. Yeah? Uh, and uh, uh, the, if, if uh, uh, collective West uh, um, caves in and, and uh, responds to this, to this nuclear blackmail, that would be really a start of a very new, a new reality. Because uh, the way how the nuclear blackmail is used now, it uh, m- m- really doesn't have a historical precedent. I go out there, I occupy the territory, I don't even occupy it, I can't do that, I claim it, and then I'm saying that this is my territory and I'm, suppo- and I'm prepared to use nuclear weapons. So if that, if, if, if that trick goes on, we are, we, we, we are in, a, in a very different, in a different world and, and forget, uh, again, for, for the US, Ukraine will also will be not the, the the, the biggest concern if if the the, the blackmail works, so what, what what the response can be that's 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 again another question. But the fact that um, the reality, the basic reality, didn't change since the Cold War. Russia is not the only nuclear superpower. The the long piece of the Cold War was achieved through the through the uh, balance of of. Uh, terror and balance of fear. And if that balance of terror and fear is, is, is broken, then, then the nuclear weapons will not perform any more stabilizing role than that, that, they, that, they, uh, that they performed during the Cold War. And we still have only nine nuclear countries in the world, but uh, up to 40 countries today have uh, um, know-how and uh, industrial base to become nuclear within next two to three years, right? So it's, it's not any more science technology of the 1945. It's even, even isolated and super poor North Korea can build nuclear weapons. So think about the rest of the world. So that's, that's again, the, 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 the sort of a challenge that goes beyond of victory and non-victory for one side or another in Ukraine. You know, I, I agree, that's uh, very well said. Uh, I was at a discussion not long ago, I can't remember where now, we might have been here, um, where somebody said, um, what would have happened in the Persian Gulf if Iraq, which, um, invaded and annexed Kuwait had had nuclear weapons. Uh, and so maybe this has been posed before. It's really interesting, isn't it? And uh, he said, well, actually, the United States would probably have been, felt compelled even more to, do, to fix the problem. Because if it, the precedent was set that a nuclear armed state could uh, declare that it owns some, somebody else's territory and threaten to use nuclear weapons, then uh, it, you know, it would be a very dangerous thing sort of across the world. And you know, uh, I'm not sure. Did the Soviet Union ever do that? Not really, right? I mean, it. Uh... Uh, the, 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 again, I, I mentioned the Cuban Missile Crisis. Again, it's, it was a different thing, but not a territory. Clear, clearly, the, uh, Khrushchev was there as a revisionist power and was trying to uh, to do things that uh, um, uh, again 
uh, advance and, and move nuclear weapons, which was probably, as far as I um, understand, the only case where it, but the, so, the, wanted, the Soviet didn't? nukes were moved outside of the Soviet borders. But he got what he wanted, didn't he? I mean, uh, the, uh, eventually, uh, after this time, this uh, secret deal, they, the, the well, Americans take the missiles well, out of Turkey. Well, well uh, again, he, he, that, that wasn't mm, uh, high, high on his agenda, but, but he got what he wanted in a different way. Uh, he uh, uh, assured that, there, that he would not lose Cuba either to the, to the United States or to China, because another concern was if he would not show him being able to protect communism. Or, or Castro, who declared himself to be a communist after Bay of Peaks. He wasn't communist. Oh, right. Before the Bay of Peaks, he declared himself to be communist after Bay of Peaks. Mm -hmm. There was Che Guevara running around the world, visiting Beijing, and so on and so forth. So uh, 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 Khrushchev gambled and, and won, but he, he, he lost at the same time, of course. <laughs> yeah. He was considered to be a loser uh, in the in the uh, 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 court of the world opinion and, of course, at home, because he, he terrified all the presidium, all he the lost his, job, he lost yeah. his job two years later. Yeah. Yeah. All right, I have to give someone else a question. <laughs> Irina? And it might be the last question, I'm sorry to say. Oh, really? <clears throat> Please sorry. introduce yourself. Uh, okay, I'm Irina Busigina and I'm a uh, visiting scholar at the Davis Center here. And uh, I have a concrete question. Uh, and probably don't take it as a strange question. Uh, because, uh, you know, I have a feeling that Russia, all what Russia was thinking about the Ukraine was miscalculations, everything. The resilience of the local communities, the spirit of Ukrainian people, the fact of Zelensky, and so on and so forth. So my question is, was it really so was Russia absolutely wrong? Or can you name anything where Russia would not be wrong regarding Ukraine, its immediate neighbor, <laughs> and strategically the most important country? Because this is my, 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 this is my, my deep surprise, that it was all 100% wrong. When I talk to the people, when I read what I read, you know, I didn't, I didn't find anything where Russia would be you know, kind of okay. And here, this was the case where Russia was not wrong. Thank you. That's an excellent question. I'm not sure I can come up with. <laughs> yeah, what did Putin get right? Um, I don't know. What do you what do you, what do you think? He, he was right that he well, could control he, his he, inner circle. Right? Yeah, it's true in terms of the managing the situation uh, locally. But that may uh, there's a, some volatil volatility there now, yeah. isn't there? Right. It's not, so, not for 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 keeps, as it were. Yeah. Uh, well, it, it's, it's, it's dangerous to point what he did right because he could continue doing that. <laughs> <laughs> this would be our little secret, okay? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, right. Uh, but uh, again, what I, what I can say, not in terms, again, that the outcome is still, but uh, certain things that were done that uh, caught, that's where we started, what caught us by surprise, right? And uh, one thing, of course, is that uh, mm, the way how he really forced Lukashenko and Belarus to become a staging, staging mm -hmm. ground mm -hmm. for, for um, a war against Ukraine and the attack on Kyiv would be really impossible without, without going th from Belarus. Uh, through the through the Chernobyl zone. So um, again, uh, the, the getting get, getting this ally not fully being committed, but at least uh, doing the surprise attack on Kiev through Chernobyl zone. So <coughs> that was uh, the, 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 that was something that uh, if other things would not be completely wrong, could uh, could, could certainly could certainly bring uh, bring uh, um, a particular uh, s s some results. Uh, but the rest, I, I would rather provide a context for why those things are wrong. And I think that um, get, getting into mind of Putin to a degree is easier than getting into mind of the people around him because they're silent. Mm -hmm. He is there saying things and writing mm -hmm. things. And uh, he clearly, he clearly, uh, his essay on the historical unity of Russians and Ukrainians clearly indicates that he is, 
He is uh, a hostage of the imperial thinking of the late 19th and the beginning of the 20th century, of the existence of one Russian nation. And uh, really, the, the whole military operation was based on this misreading of history, which brings me to the punchline. Just read good history, <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, well, but but that's that's that that that's an indication of what 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 really bad history can do, and and uh, uh, to a degree that we are here completely puzzled and, and make things up, trying to answer the question what he did right. But it is interesting that when you uh, say I'm thinking of a few other maybe uh, sound judgments that that Russia has proven to be much better at managing relationships d during this uh, high conflict period with remote countries or countries th th with which it doesn't share any cultural heritage at all. So I would say China, <clears throat> India, uh, generally the, uh, the Arab states, uh, certainly the, the Gulf states, the Saudis today, mm -hmm. right, are cooperating on oil prices. So somehow, you know, um, despite its stagnation, Russian diplomacy is capable sometimes of achieving successes on those fronts, whereas with the Ukrainians, uh, with whom they're intermingled in so many ways, they seem prone to making really dumb judgments. Go figure. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe you could write a book about that. And that will be good history. Yeah. <laughs> Please thank me, no, join me in thanking Tim and Serhi for a fantastic conversation. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. Okay. Well, that was fun.